I, I live in uh, uh, kind of two worlds of music technology, and that's a term that's, that's pretty vague depending on uh, how, how you're coming into it and your, your experience with it. Um, I studied music composition in, uh, at, at the Hart School of Music in Connecticut and went on to work more in recording engineering and, and do some of the projects that, um, that you just heard about. And uh, off and on, I got really interested in the work, um, the composition work that I had done in school and studied and how that would combine with a recording studio. One of those places was in uh, electronic music. And I got uh, quite interested in music synthesis and generating sounds from um, uh, different types of electronic instruments, both software and hardware. So I'm going to share a little bit of um, some of the, the history of this uh, uh, medium, if you will, and also a little bit about, uh, or give you some demonstrations on how we can make sounds um, using some software instruments that I have on here. Um, there's a, a book that I uh, put together with a, a friend of mine who teaches up at Berkeley in Boston called Creating Sounds from Scratch uh, that came out a couple years ago on Oxford Press. We do have a few copies afterwards if you're, you're interested in picking one up. Um, some, uh, some of the stuff we're going to talk about today, particularly some of the history stuff, uh, plays into the first chapter there. And then every other chapter after that's about helping you figure out how to make sounds with whatever you're using. We, do, we use Logic quite a bit, uh, which is kind of the, the advanced version of GarageBand. Um, amazingly sophisticated program, but we try to be somewhat agnostic and bring in some other, other tools as well. So it's less about the specific tool and more about the process. So uh, just a little bit, of, uh, little bit of history and where some of these things fall in. Uh, the first instrument, when I was researching for the book, I was trying to figure out what I would call the very first electronic instrument. And the one that um, seemed to, uh, to fit well was this instrument called the Telharmonium, um, which was hugely impractical, uh, weighs 200 tons, um, 2,000 electric switches and transmitted performances over telegraph wires. So uh, the, the instrument w was innovative in that it, it came up with an idea of using something that looked like, like, a, like a gear. Uh, we'll see a picture of it with a Hammond organ coming up. And the, the idea with the gear was as it spun next to something that looked a lot like a, uh, what we think of as a guitar pickup now, it created an electrical oscillation there. And if they put a whole bunch of these together, they could come up with these sort of complex waveforms, these complex sounds, and at different pitches. The problem was that at this time, there weren't amplifiers. So in order to really hear the thing, you had to make these huge disks. And it took a lot of energy to run them, and then they would use something like you would expect to see from an old phonograph, like a, like a passive resonator in order to uh, to generate the sound. So it was pretty impractical and it was, uh, it was used in New York. I think it was used in a, um, to, to pipe in music in a uh, department store, if I remember correctly. So that, that I give the credit to the first synthesizer where you could, you could kind of, albeit impractical, come up with these interesting combinations of tones um, to generate a new sound. It seems weird to put a clock in the middle of a talk on, on music synthesis, but uh, the name on that clock is kind of important. It's Hammond. Um, have any of you heard of or ever played a Hammond organ, like a Hammond B3 organ? A bunch of you. Okay, this, there's, uh, they're really big and heavy. I've had to move them before. We've got one up at Peabody on wheels, which is very nice. And I've actually got several in here, um, which is great, so I can just carry it on my back. My, my colleague's a big Hammond fan. He wouldn't, he wouldn't agree with me on that. Um, but Hammond, uh, Hammond, um, developed the clock, and that oddly kind of led him to developing the, um, the tone generator for the organ, as we'll see coming up. Uh, the theremin is an interesting instrument. The theremin has a great story. Uh, Russian Leon Theremin, who was also um, uh, suspected to be a Russian spy uh, in his times when he was uh, traveling to the United States and, and uh, demonstrating the instrument. Um, this is a really interesting instrument. I'm going to play you a little demo from the person who's often, the woman who's often cited as the, uh, the virtuoso of the theremin, Clara Rockmore. Um, this is a very simple instrument that's incredibly difficult to play. Anybody ever tried playing the theremin? Wow, cool, awesome. Um, I've got one at home. I'm terrible at it. 
Uh, but when my students come down to hang out, they always get it out and play with it. It's a lot of fun. So uh, you can see Leon there where he's got his left hand. It's a little hard to see from this angle. I've got a better uh, picture uh, diagram coming up. But moving his hand closer and further away from a, a metallic loop on the left side, which is affecting volume, and he's got his right hand up with this vertical rod that's affecting frequency or pitch. Uh, so just to give you a little taste of this, here's a, a Clara Rockmore video. of it anyway. It, it's, it's kind of a haunting sound you associate it with old sci-fi movies and things, but it can be really expressive and beautiful too. And what's really interesting is how this instrument has kind of um, come back into, uh, somewhat into vogue, but certainly back in the 90s when the, the company that um, Bob Moog was uh, running at the time uh, came, uh, started developing theremins again and selling kits where you could build them and then selling completed versions and a whole, bu whole new crop of artists started using these, uh, particularly in the New York areas where I was most familiar with it. Um, really interesting instruments, and when you combine them with some of the modern effects and some of the modern tools that we have in the studio, it can, uh, it can really create some things that are hard to make with, with other instruments. So, um, not the least of which, including the, a new uh, Moog that I got to play with, a Moog Theremin, um, which has pitch correction in it. Um, it's really, really hard to play a theremin in tune. You can't, there's, there's not so much muscle memory where you can, you know, hold on to a fingerboard or a fretboard, well, fretboard's easy, uh, but hold on to a fingerboard or some kind of fretless instrument. This is just the air, so you're kind of getting used to where your hand is in relative, but, uh, relation to the rod, but you've got to use your, your ear and really pay close attention uh, to the intonation. So you can cheat a little bit with some of the newer ones that actually you can engage an auto-tune function. Uh, and it'll, if you're not quite there, it'll drift you right into the, the correct pitch. Um, so this is, uh, th these are the two uh, controls on the instrument, the two main controls. So you have volume uh, with your left hand, and the closer you get to it, I always thought this was backwards, the closer you get to it, the quieter it gets. The farther away you get, the louder it gets. So if you walk away from the thing, it just starts screaming really loud. Um, and pitch gets really high. Uh, if you touch it, it just shoots up, so it's like an exponential ramp up to frequency. So it's like, you know, it's, it's, it has characteristics of like a string instrument that's not fretted, um, just you're not touching anything. It's just the, the conductivity between your hand and the, and the metal is what, uh, is, is what creates the, what we call a control voltage that's then affecting how fast the oscillator is going and what the, uh, what the amplitude is of the amplifier. The, the knobs that are on the front of this will vary depending on the model, but usually they give you some variation in tone. So you can have a, a darker, richer, um, sort of uh, thicker tone or something that's uh, a little bit more pure. Um, uh, in the early days of the theremin, they would describe it as somewhere between a violin and a, and a woman's voice. Um, so you can kind of hear that character from the, from the uh, Clara Rockmore recording. Uh, as, so the hard part, as I said, with playing this darn thing is you're not touching anything and you don't have much to reference. So there's a couple interesting uh, variations that came out. One was called the Onus Martino, where you can find some really amazing performances on, on YouTube of this thing. Um, I thought, um, are there any Radiohead fans? So this is Radiohead actually using one in a performance. the keyboard becomes a reference for the position so you're moving this wire
pretty interesting. There's, there's kind of a, uh, a following of, of those instruments out there now as well. So I, I mentioned the Hammond a little bit earlier, and Lawrence Hammond uh, did something very similar to what the Teleharmonium did, but on a much smaller scale, because now he had amplifiers. So he was able to take the idea, I'm not I'm not sure if he was directly influenced by, by the design of the teleharmonium or if this is something that he came up on his own, but there's the idea of kind of a gear with what we might call like sine wave uh, shapes going around the edges of it. And as, that, uh, as the wheel spins, so what, what he calls a tone wheel, as that spins, it varies the distance between it and the pickup coil. So you get this oscillation between there very much like a string vibrating near a pickup coil in an electric guitar. And then you've got two leads coming out of there that you could then amplify. So the organ, one of the reasons it's so darn heavy is it's got all, a whole bunch of tone wheels inside of it that are allowing you to craft the sort of uh, complex wave, the complex sound that you're trying to achieve. Uh, I, I'll, I'll give you a, a quick demo in a second. Uh, bring the, the, the um, clock back up here because uh, one of the things that's interesting about the Hammond is it can't be out of tune because it's based on the 60 cycles um, of power coming in from the wall. So as long as you're in a country that has 60 cycle power coming in, this thing can't play out of tune. If you take it to Europe or somewhere that is 50 cycle, you have to put on a kit with it that'll convert it so that it won't play flat. Uh, on your gigs and the band's wondering, what the heck is wrong with a keyboard player? All right, so we, we, as I mentioned, we do have some pretty good emulations of, uh, of Hammond organs that are much easier to carry around. Um, so let me jump over to Logic here for a second. Any Logic users out there? Got a couple? Okay, cool. So um, I'm using an instrument that Arturia makes their, their Hammond sampler, and then I'm using a Logic plugin that's a rotor speaker. So one of the keys uh, to the sound of a Hammond organ is uh, when it goes through this thing called a Leslie speaker. There's a couple other companies that make it, but the Leslie's the one that's most associated with the instrument. There's a multi-pin plug that you put in the back of the organ and then plug into this, um, this cabinet. The cabinet's about, maybe about this big and it's got a revolving speaker on the top and it's got kind of a big low frequency drum on the bottom that can also move. And uh, in the studio we'll mic it up usually with a couple mics on top to get the kind of Doppler effect of the spinning uh, speaker. And then down at the bottom uh, getting some of the low frequency um, uh, aspects of the sound down there. So if I... Quiet. Sounds like going to a baseball game, doesn't it? But what's, why I'm considering this a synthesizer and, and music technology is that if, I, if, if you're not familiar with these, the black and white reverse keys down here are actually presets. So even on the big uh, mechanical Hammond instrument, you can click those uh, black keys at the bottom and store presets in there. And we see all these draw bars moving around. And the draw bars, if I, if I clear them, the, the low C is gonna clear them out, I can pull them up one at a time and build a complex wave, right? So I keep saying complex wave. If I took just a regular old sine wave, like a test tone that you would hear on, on like a, you know, a television or something where there, um, something happens and they lose program feed and you just hear this one kilohertz tone, all sounds are made up of a whole bunch of those. So when we have a complex wave, it's actually made up of a whole lot of sine waves. And if I, if I brought up here a clarinet and had somebody play an A440, and then a trumpet and played an A440. They both have that same sine wave at 440, but what's above it is totally different, right? It, and that's what makes one sound like a trumpet and one sound like a clarinet or an oboe or whatever it might be. So as I'm putting together a sound on the organ, I can build the harmonic structure of the sound by pulling out low draw bars or high draw bars. It's not like a like a, what we think of as a modern synthesizer, but we can come up with some pretty interesting variations of tone here. Right? So 
So the presets have the typical sounds that you'd associate with the instrument. We can go through and get a whole bunch of sounds. So it's really kind of like a synthesizer. I, I hesitated putting this in my book because it's, most people don't refer to the Hammond as a synthesizer, but it really kind of is. And it's the type of synthesizer that we would call additive synthesis, meaning that we're, we're generating tones at different frequencies to create a complex wave, as opposed to the opposite, which would be starting with something like a big chunk of marble and chipping away at it until we got the sound that we were looking for. Right? Um, the, uh, probably the, the one that most people reference as the oldest electronic music synthesizer in the way that we think about it now um, is the one that was uh, developed and used uh, at the Columbia, uh, the Princeton, uh, Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center uh, back in the 1950s. And this is a big wall of a, uh, of a computer system where you would put together punch car, uh, a sheet of punch punched notes in the, uh, in the paper that would feed through the system and it would play back whatever was in those holes, almost like a player piano, except it was generating sounds off the, uh, off the, uh, uh, the, the synthesizers that are in here. And then you can see these cutting lathes here where they would have cut to a uh, disc, like a, a vinyl disc, um, to make it available to anybody who wants to listen to it. Um, Mellotron, now, Mellotron is really neat. Back when I started getting into electronic music, um, or getting into music in general, and I was always interested in technology, and so th these things sort of got, got tangled up together, it was right around the time that samplers were starting to come about. So like the 1980s when, you know, people were getting a little tired of trying to craft sounds using uh, techniques like FM synthesis and subtractive synthesis and saying, What's that supposed to be? That's a piano. Oh, really? Okay, that's a piano. Um, wouldn't it be cool if we could actually record a piano and every time I hit a note on a keyboard, it just played the recording back of that note? So that became this idea that in some ways is still evolving now as computers get faster, as uh, recordings can be at higher resolutions. Um, we can record every single note on the keyboard, whereas back then we could only record like every minor third maybe at the most. Um, but predating all that from the 60s was this thing called the Mellotron, which is kind of uh, follows along with um, the evolution of these sort of uh, unbelievably um, uh, sort of complex and, and cumbersome uh, mechanical instruments like the Telharmonium, which is the king of what I just said. Uh, the, the Hammond B3, which is a great instrument, but it's also very heavy and bulky. Um, this instrument's goal was to basically be a sampler. They didn't call it that then, but it's really, it's a, it's a sample player. So if we see on the right, there's like all these sort of vertical uh, brown lines going down underneath the instrument. And each of those is a, um, is a cartridge that has a tape in it. And the tape could have, say, the recording of a flute. And there's a recording of a flute for every single key. So when you press down a key, it pulls this tape that's stored in the bin there, it sucks it through really just a tape player, just like the same mechanism you'd have in a reel-to-reel -reel tape, tape recorder. And it, uh, the, the, um, once that starts, sorry, it's, what we're looking at here is actually the end result of it. So what would happen if I release the key is the downward pressure of that spring would pull the tape back. And then when I push the key down, that cap stand, which is a wheel that spins, is going to pull the tape through into that bin until it runs out of tape. And then you've got to let go of the key for it to do a quick rewind with the spring and then play through it again. Kind of crazy and practical, but really pretty cool and was very inspiring to, uh, to a number of artists uh, of this era. And I've, I've, of course, got a Mellotron in my back pocket here, so let me pull that up. This, this is the Mellotron that's now part of Logic. I, I had a third party one, but this one sounds pretty amazing. Um, they didn't go overboard with the look of it, although it has the nice white here. Uh, but if I, uh, if I were to play a couple notes of this, I think you'd find it very familiar. Um. Let's take that up an octave. Right? Oh. 
right? So the Beatles were using this back in the Sgt. Pepper era. That's the sound of the flutes on, on Sgt. Pepper. It's not real flute, so to speak. It is, but they were recorded into a tape, and then the tape was in the cartridge and the Mellotron, and that's, what they, that's, that's the sound that they were playing back. Uh, the Moody Blues are another band that are, are uh, associated with the Mellotron. A lot of their um, sort of ambient pad sounds and things were coming from the Mellotron. And the, the, the uh, software versions of the Mellotron are really quite impressive. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're fairly simple recordings and old recordings that people associate with the Mellotron are pretty easy to capture. So it's pretty easy to put together. And then some of the software units will allow you to, I didn't look to see, this is a new one that I just started playing with. Um, let's see if it... Let's see, I just tested it out with you here. So it, it actually keeps going. Um, whereas the real instrument would stop. So some of the software em emulations actually stop when the real instrument would have stopped, or they have a switch to say you want to play it like a real Mellotron, or you want to cheat and let it go on as long as you want it to go on. So that was really the only way back in, um, in that time period before we had um, digital recording technology that we could get the sound of a real acoustic instrument and reproduce it kind of on demand with whatever notes we wanted to um, uh, whatever notes we needed for our, for our music. Let's skip over that. All right. Um, so there's a neat story, uh, kind of the classic story in uh, uh, electronic synthesizer music was a little bit of a battle of the East and the West, although they didn't know each other or existed for a long time. So on the East Coast, you had Bob Moog. And he started building uh, theremins with his dad in his basement in New York City as a kid. And when he got older, he went to, if I remember the sequence right, he went to Columbia and then he ended up at, uh, at Cornell and was studying physics and, and electronics. And he started a company where he was, wanted to build a synthesizer. He wanted to take the idea of a theremin but turn it into an instrument that had some more variation to it. And a clever thing that he did was he, 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 would, it, he admitted that he wasn't a very good business person, and there's lots of evidence of that, and he wasn't a musician. He loved music and he loved the idea of the instruments, but he was an engineer and he loved electronics and that's what he really understood. So he worked with a composer, a guy by the name of Herb Deutsch, to uh, say like, you know, as a composer, as a keyboard player, or uh, getting ahead of myself, as a composer, what, what do you think would be useful for musicians to use this thing? The theremin was really kind of impractical, and Deutsch is the one who's credited as saying, well, what if you put a keyboard on it? And it was at this time that the sort of theremin became married with, with a piano in some ways, although we were limited to just one note, a monophonic one note at a time. Um, but that was kind of a big deal, and I think the reason that most people, even if they have sort of a cursory knowledge of music technology, probably know the name Bob Moog, or they or know it as Moog, but he said Moog. He had some sign on his desk that said, my, my name doesn't sound like a cow or something, I forget what it was. But, um, so I often feel pretentious saying it, but the man liked Moog, so I go with that. Uh, but on, on the West Coast, the whole other group of composers were working with a developer uh, tinkerer, you know, putting together these, you know, the, the happenings of the 60s and these wild light shows with, uh, with these wild electronic music um, uh, accompaniments. And he was developing this instrument that uh, we, we have come to know as the Buchla box, so it was Don Buchla. And he, so he was, he was developing an instrument at the same time Moog was. Um, perhaps fortunately there were no online uh, chat rooms or listservs where they were comparing notes because they completely, they made pretty much completely different things. And as they became fam w familiar with each other's work, they still very much had their own camps. Buchla's idea, he thought it was a mistake to put a keyboard on it because he, he said that, well, a keyboard immediately restricts you to 12 semitones, right? So, yeah, okay, you could detune it or you could maybe change the the scale and do things like that, but it really, he felt it was unnecessarily restrictive that all of a sudden you're handcuffing modern technology with old technology. Whereas Moog saw the value in um, making an electronic instrument more approachable 
by a musician who's not necessarily a technologist or somebody who's, who's uh, uh, well versed in technology. So composers that were associated with, with this instrument were much more interested in you know, microtonality and doing things that really get away from sort of conventional Western music. Whereas on the East Coast, you had the, the crowd sort of building around Moog with, the, um, um, with, with his instruments that were, were primarily keyboard based. So the modular synthesizer is the one that often gets um, cited as sort of his big contribution. Let's get a, a, a virtual one up here. No. Modular. This is also significantly lighter weight than a real one. Um, we have a, uh, a, a really nice Moog modular up at Peabody in the uh, computer music studios that is really well kept. They did a major overhaul of it a few years ago, but it's in really good working order. Um, so the idea was you've got all of these different modules. These oscillators are where the sound is originating. And then we've got uh, different things of uh, influencing how the sound evolves over time, um, the, the quality of the sound in terms of the overtones and the harmonics that are part of it. And the composer, the sound designer, excuse me, has a lot of flexibility in implementing and being very creative with how they put the sound together by just running patch chords from one, one um, output to another input. So this is a, a virtual version of the instrument that uh, Arturia also makes. There's also, if you have an iPad, if you're interested in this, I feel like it was like $30 or something. There's a, there's a, a, a Moog modular synth for iPad, which actually sounds really good. And it's, you know, these things, they, they just started selling these again, and I think they're like $15,000 or something like that. It's kind of crazy. So for $29.95, you could have one on your iPad, and uh, it, it needs much less maintenance, um, uh, as long as uh, iOS 13 doesn't break it or something. Um, so this, uh, this instrument gives the composer a lot of flexibility. It was really big. Uh, the artist that I immediately think of is actually touring with something like this is Keith Emerson, who had a big, huge one on stage with him, and um, shockingly liked to knock it over in, in the performance. I couldn't imagine being the guy that had to figure out what broke and put it back together. But it really is a beautiful sounding instrument. Um, you can get some really interesting colors from it. So I'm triggering that from the keyboard here. And we've got the keyboard um, module or, or, uh, th that goes with the instrument that you would literally take a chord out of and plug it into the part of the instrument that you wanted to uh, have control over. So this was really cool, but it was really big. Um, perhaps the thing that really kicked Moog maybe into uh, being a, a bit of a household name at the time was the um, switched on Bach which was taking the music of J.S. Bach and, and realizing it with this instrument. This is a monophonic instrument. Um, of course, because it's software, we could cheat and put it in a polyphonic mode. But monophonically, um, Wendy Carlos was able to go through with her 16-track tape recorder and record every part of, say, the, um, uh, of, a, of a Bach, um, uh, now I'm blanking on the, the pieces right now, um, a Brandenburg concerto, uh, where every part of the of the the strings is layered in as a different uh, monophonic part, almost like um, she was performing uh, each of the different string parts of the uh, orchestration one at a time through this instrument, without any kind of click track or without any kind of um, uh, quantization that we might associate with modern instruments. So it's really an impressive achievement, and it really took off. It caught a lot of attention, and it. It spawned a bunch of other artists to do similar work. I have a friend that um, had a very successful record with the Tchaikovsky's 1812, uh, um, where they did it entirely on an ARP synthesizer. So they, um, they weren't using the Moog, but they did it with, um, with, the, uh, with the ARP. So pretty neat. Um, the problem with that instrument, though, of course, is that it was just really big. And another big or small innovation of, um, of Bob Moog was making the Mini Moog. 
And the mini Moog was, as you see there, it's their full size uh, keys on it, but it's like a three and a half octave keyboard that did a lot of the same things that, uh, that the big modular did without all of the patching complexities. So you kind of had to learn the routing within the instrument in order to make it work. There's also been a huge resurgence of these. One of my, uh, the carrot at the end of my book writing uh, stick, if you will, was, okay, if I finish this book, I'm gonna buy myself one of the new Moog. So I, I have a Moog Sub 37 in my studio, which I love. This one was a little bit out of my price range, but the Sub 37 is pretty nice. Um, and of course, you guessed it, there are really nice software emulations of this. Sometimes they say Moog, sometimes you can just tell that that's what they're talking about because they didn't want to pay Moog a royalty on it or something. But this instrument gives you... We have a lot of the same controls we had on the big instrument, but just not as many of them. And we're now routing by using switches rather than using patch cores. So we're turning on and off oscillators. We're setting the volume of each of them with a little mixer here, affecting the, the filter. Still the same kind of design of, uh, uh, of filters that um, uh, were used in the modular, but uh, uh, much easier to access here and easy to move around. There's a great story of, uh, um, I believe it was Keith Emerson uh, was drooling over this instrument, really wanted one, and he had gone to some famous actor's house in London, and he said, I can't believe you have a mini Moog. Where did you get that? And the guy said, oh, the thing's broken. You can have it if you want. He's like, really? What happened to it? It only plays one note at a time. Um, so he, uh, I guess he got a free, uh, free mini Moog because the guy thought it was broken. Um, so it's a, it's a beautiful instrument, it's a lot of fun to play with. There is, um, uh, I believe there is an iOS version of that too if you're uh, interested in that, uh, that side of things. So, um, how are we doing time? I'm gonna be conscious, I, I could talk all afternoon about this stuff, so I gotta make sure I don't go too far. This is one of the new models called the Voyager. Um, we have one of those up at Peabody as well. It's a pretty cool instrument, works very much like the old one. Um, two key improvements are that you can store settings on it, so when you come up with a patch you really like, you can actually store it in there. The old one, every single time you played a, a song you know, uh, on tour or in the studio, you had to play a song again, you had to dial up and you had to listen to it. Was that right? You, know, you can move the dials until you get exactly where it was before. This stores them in there. The other thing is this stays in tune, which may seem trivial, but the old Moogs were known for, uh, uh, for drifting uh, in intonation. So there's actually a tuning knob right on the front of it. So as it heated up, one of the design flaws of the instrument uh, was that the, um, the oscillators that are producing the, the, the sound were put next to the power supply. So as the power supply got warmer, the oscillators drifted in pitch. Um, Arp, who was kind of their competitor at the time, Alan R. Perlman, uh, he figured out that's what was going on. So in his instruments, the power supply was here and the oscillators were over here. Um, all right, so there's a whole bunch of things. I'm not gonna go through all these other instruments, but things really exploded when you get into the, um, into the 70s and into the 80s and, and beyond. Whoops. Um, with all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of digital technology coming out, we had things like the, the Synclavier, which is the one that looks like it has a file cabinet uh, next to it, which uh, was a, um, one of the key elements of some of Michael Jackson's work, like Thriller. Um, there's the uh, instrument on the bottom right with the, the green and black uh, display on it called a Fairlight. Um, also has a really fascinating history and the, the artist perhaps most so associated with that instrument is Thomas Dolby who's a, a colleague of mine now in the department. So if you know, She Blinded Me With Science was his big hit. Um, one of his other big hits that you wouldn't normally think was his was uh, uh, um, uh, ringtones. Uh, he came up with the idea of ringtones and eventually sold it to Nokia. And uh, he had developed the technology for it out in Silicon Valley. So he's done a lot of interesting things. The bottom right side is a thing called the Lindrum. So it wasn't, um, uh, it, it's more sort of early uh, drum machine kind of sounds we associate with the 80s groups like, or, or artists like Madonna. Um, most of her records are using a Lindrum. So that was a huge sound. 
of the 80s, where now they're sort of doing purpose-built instruments that are specifically doing one thing. Um, I will point out one in a little bit more detail. The one on the bottom left here uh, is called a Prophet 5, and that was the first major instrument that broke the uh, polyphonic barrier. Have any of you watched the TV show Stranger Things? Then you've heard a lot of Prophet 5. Um, they're big fans of Prophet 5, and so they, they, they have some of the newer versions of his instruments that have come out now. But this is, uh, that's, a, that's the sort of modern association with this instrument. But he, uh, Dave Smith, the guy that developed these, he figured out that the only way that we were going to get a, an analog instrument to play multiple, multiple pitches at the same time was to have a computer control, so like a, a, a chip that's, that's accumulating which notes are being pressed on the keyboard and then assigning them to the available oscillators so that they could play all at the same time. So there's that sort of uh, um, uh, digital uh, logic element to it of assigning notes to specific analog oscillators, but otherwise everything about what's uh, producing sound with this instrument is analog. Jump through a couple more of these. So, just really quickly, jump through uh, jump through some of these ideas. Really, every every type of sound that we're developing in synthesis has the same kind of steps that we need. We need to create raw materials to start with. That could be a sample, like the flute recording and the mellotron. It could be an oscillator on a Moog instrument. It could be a digital file that's being played back. It's raw materials that we're starting with to my friend uh, Thomas Dolby, I guess. So we start with, with subtractive synthesis. Um, we start with like a, a basically as though we have a big chunk of marble and we're just going to cut away everything that isn't part of the sound that we want to end up with and then get, uh, get to something that we're, um, that, that we're going to use, that we're interested in. This was a photo I took that was, uh, we were setting up to take the photo for the book and my grad assistant at the time was patching it up for me. And, and I wanted a long exposure and accidentally got an amazing picture. Uh, so I call that the ghost of Edwin. Um, Edwin is setting up the Moog there, and uh, he was much better at patching that thing together than I was. So, all right. Let me jump out of this for a second and back over to logic. Wanted to, um, I know I'm, I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you, like coming out of a fire hose today. Um, but I wanted to show you a couple newer ideas of how, um, how sound can be uh, created and manipulated uh, for synthesis purposes. One of my favorites right now that I've really enjoyed playing with, um, a good example of this is in this instrument called Codex. Uh, and it's a type of synthesis called Wavetable. Wavetable's been around a long time, but it's really kind of evolved in a lot of ways. And I came up with an idea that I thought you guys might, uh, might like today. So um, I've got one sound that we're hearing, which is right here. And let me just play you what it sounds like. Let me turn down the speed for a moment. Doesn't really sound very interesting at all. But if you knew where it came from and then looked at some ways we could mess with it, you might find it a little bit more interesting. So I thought, Howard Community College, what could be a funny thing to do with that? So Howard, the name Howard. Howard, the phone is ringing! So I took just the Howard part of that and I put it into Codex and Codex resynthesizes it. So I went under import and I found the little bit of Howard, uh, Howard's mom yelling Howard and stuck it in here and the software resynthesized it, which means it basically created a whole bunch of slices and it analyzed each slice for the frequency response at that position. So, so the, the shape, the, the sort of complex waveform or the shape of the, um, the, uh, the frequency at that point so that when I bring it into the instrument, I can control how quickly we run through those slices. 
I could find even just like one slice. So I could play with just this, this one word that on its own is very unmusical, but playing around with it a little bit, I could come up with something that I thought was actually kind of cool. So this is, this is like one of those TV shows where they're showing you how to cook something and then all of a sudden they pour it out of the oven and it's done. So. atmospheric sound but it can be really inspiring to pull up something that's completely non-musical and all of a sudden get these really interesting tones out of it and sometimes just creating means you need something to kind of give you a spark to get you started with it right so I've I found this to be really cool like if I'm in a rut and I'm trying to come up with a sound I just grab something that's completely unrelated throw it into codex and see what it uh, see what it comes up with one more example and then I'll I'll see if anyone have any questions Alchemy is an instrument that Logic uh, bought, or Apple bought, to include in Logic not too long ago. And this has another way of starting with raw materials that's actually quite interesting. You say, what the heck could that sound be? It's admittedly not the most exciting sound. But if I go over to the spectral uh, characteristics here, it's actually turning that image into sound. So the uh, left to right is obviously time, and from the bottom, the y-axis, if you will, is frequency, and then we have different intensities of um, uh, white and gray. This is mostly just white and black. But um, then we can go in here and we could tweak this a little bit. So we could tell it things like that we don't want to include. We could, we could erase some elements of it that we don't want to have in the sound. We could um, mask some things out here. So if I, for example, whoops, I didn't do that very well. If I were to mask around the shield here. Oh, I'm drawing now, sorry, here we go. Like that, and bring my endpoint over, it's thinking about it. Bring my endpoint over. Let's get rid of that. Then the shield could just be the what we're working with. And we could add a loop to it. We could find a spot that we like. And that could be a texture that's buried under something else that's going on. So sometimes just starting with an image or starting with another sound and just seeing how far you can go manipulating that can be, uh, can be pretty inspiring to come up with new ideas. So, in summary, really just playing with the idea of starting with some kind of raw material and then manipulating that through different tools that are common to these instruments, things like low frequency oscillators. It sounds really complicated. It's really just a thing that's vibrating at a slow speed at different patterns. And we could have that affect the pitch, making vibrato. We could have it affecting what we call the cutoff frequency so that it's, it's sort of a uh, a wah type quality to it, or like a hand going in front of a trumpet and darkening the sound coming out of a trumpet. We have envelopes that allow us to shape uh, any number of different elements over time. It's really, uh, it's, it's so accessible right now to find even web app instruments or uh, inexpensive instruments that you can play with and come up with some really pretty impressive sounds that sound quite good. Um, a little tip on the, along those lines is, you know, some people will get a, a, a synth app on their phone or their tablet and they say, just this thing doesn't sound really good. You're sending it through a speaker that big. Uh, plug it into a better speaker, plug it into a stereo system or something, or into, you know, put some headphones in. All of a sudden the sound will really come alive. There's a lot of great sound in, uh, that these things are capable of, but the, the speakers are, are, uh, that, are, that are in these devices are, are, are somewhat limited given the, the size um, that uh, they're trying to fit it into the device. So. All right, I wanted to save some time for questions. Anybody want to ask any questions? Yes. <laughs>